Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I think pediatric intestinal obstruction, obstruction is a good way to start right after lunch because we're probably all feeling a little uneasy there ourselves right now. So, thank you for the opportunity to speak here, um, not only today but in the next three days. And I hope you join me in a adventure of children's imaging. <coughs> what I've discovered is that there are two types of people when it comes to children's imaging. There's the lovers and the haters. And those of us that are pediatric imaging lovers are few in number, so I hope to have some converted by the end of today. So, pediatric intestinal obstruction, um, I've broken it down into some congenital as well as acquired pathologies, and trying to keep things really simple. The idea is not for you to walk out of here um, with 10 years of pediatric experience, but to be able to go away confident that what decisions you make are, are the right decisions. So the objectives that we have here to look at various types, to describe them as upper and lower types of bowel obstruction, understand and describe typical and atypical features, identify features of malrotation and volvulus, and we'll do some highlights of that one in particular, and to look at various other bowel obstructions in children. So as I said, neonatal intestinal obstruction is something we try to divide into high obstruction and low obstruction. And high obstruction are those in the um, upper abdomen that include malrotation, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. Certainly this should be a consideration until proven otherwise in any child that presents with bilious vomiting. Duodenal atresia, stenosis, or web usually present in the immediate neonatal period. However, sometimes they can present later on. And those ones typically are a bit more difficult and challenging to diagnose because the patients have been fairly well up until that time. Jejunal atresia is fairly classic imaging, and pyloric atresia, which is quite rare, but does occur. Low obstruction are, as you imagine, colonic or anal rectal. Um, you think about anal rectal malformations, colonic atresia, Hirschsprungs, which is a relative obstruction, meconium plug, and small f colon. And then other low obstructions would involve the distal ileum, again, ileal atresia, complete obstruction, and meconium ileus, which again is a relative so what to do? X-rays of the abdomen and pelvis. Still, in children, X-rays and ultrasound are frequently the mainstay of initial imaging that we have in children. The reason being is that kids move, and both of those are fairly quick. You can chase a child with ultrasound, but it's hard to chase them with a CT machine. So those we use. Um, and the idea is to try and determine whether it's a high or low obstruction to guide your future imaging. Again. With high obstruction, you have to exclude malrotation and volvulus. So frequently what we use post after the x-ray, um, if we do think it's a high obstruction, is a contrast study, an upper GI series. And the reason there is to look at the ligament trites and to exclude volvulus. And for the lower obstruction, contrast enema, you want to see the sequel position, the caliber, and whether or not the content is normal or abnormal. And one of the things um, takeaway points is for colonic studies um, in children, we rarely use barium, particularly in the neonatal period, because of the potential cause uh, or potential um, for incisation, and so we always use water soluble. So, upper GI, if you have a nasogastric tube in place, that's great, water soluble, particularly in neonates, is well tolerated. If you've ever tasted it, it's horrible. So uh, in older children, it's a little harder to get them to, uh, to drink it, and certainly sometimes you need them to drink enough for it to be a reliable study. So if the child is older, um, barium for an upper GI is fine, and it's better to have a study than no study at all. And with children, certainly cooperation is usually your biggest challenge. So for an upper GI, what do you need to do? The patient has to be straight, vertebral pedicles aligned, and it's important to get the first pass of contrast through the duodenum before you have overlapping loops and you can't tell what's going on. You should look for the duodenal jejunal junction to be at the level of the duodenal ball to the left of the vertebral pedicle and make sure that the ribs are symmetric. So here we have the normal duodenal jejunal junction and you can see, there we go, that's the DJ flexure is here at the same level as the duodenal cap and the proximal jejunal loops in this direction. So intestinal atresias, we talked about this a little bit just in the introduction. 
Gastrointestinal changes are approximately one in 10,000 births. And the idea is that there's in duodenal atresia that it's failed recanalization. But in the others, it's, it's more likely um, to be due um, to vascular ischemic events in the remainder of the bowel. And that's why when you see duodenal atresia, it's usually a focal segment, whereas in the other atresia, they're frequently multiple, and you can have multiple in different strings just based on the uh, distribution. So this is a case of pyloric atresia. This child um, had a large stomach on um, antenatal imaging as well, and you can see that there's no distal gas. So pyloric atresia is very rare. It's less than 1% of all the atresias. Um, but just to recognize it for what it is, uh, it can masquerade sometimes as a duodenal atresia if you're not actually seeing um, contrast or air rather in the proximal duodenum. Other causes of upper obstruction in this area are gastrocantral web, and you need meticulous attention to detail to be able to see this. And it's important to be able to know whether or not there's one web or more than one web. And in this case, you can see with the patient in the right lateral position outlining the um, antrum here that there are actually two webs. So moving then into the duodenum, congenital obstruction intrinsic to the bowel would be atresias, webs, and stenosis, and external compression uh, relate to lab spans, duplications, hematomas, and annular pancreas. So all of these things you should be thinking about as you go through your imaging. So if it's pylorus, what next? And then go from there. So in this case of duodenal atresia, that you can tell that there's a lot more going on here than just duodenal atresia. No, it's not labeled incorrectly. This child had heterotaxy. So remember as well, think that frequently uh, things go together. And if you have one abnormality, make sure that you search for another. In this case, again, you see the double bubble configuration of the x-ray where you have the large um, gastric uh, distension as well as proximal duodenal distension. And the yellow arrows point to the pancreas, which is encircling the duodenum. And this was the case that uh, the child actually had some um, feeding issues but wasn't diagnosed right away and then subsequently ended up having an upper GI. And you can see this relatively apple core looking type lesion in both views, the right lateral and the supine. And that was from the annular pancreas found in surgery. Duodenal duodenal webs, webs can occur anywhere, as in the antrum, you can see them in the duodenum as well. And this one was at the duodenal duodenal junction. You can see the proximal dilatation and the band-like filling defect, which is distended here and persisted, so you knew it wasn't a transient filling defect. Again, duodenal atresia, x-rays can be quite helpful in this regard. You see several proximal dilated bowel loops frequently, and you need to look for other ancillary findings. In this case, we have peritoneal calcification along the right flank, which is layering adjacent to the liver and in the peritoneal space. They can extend in male infants into the scrotum, so make sure you look for peritoneal calcification anywhere, as it can give you a clue as to intra-abdominal um, obstruction and potential rupture. Contrast studies in the lower GI category. As I said before, barium can harden and can be very difficult to evacuate. So if you're worried at all that a child is obstructed, that's probably one of the worst choices you can make. Um, we use water soluble contrast for our NMA exams, particularly in neonates, and they can be uh, actually therapeutic in conditions with meconium plug. Yeah, if you can reflux contrast into the terminal ileum, um, then it's good to do so because you can uh, see whether or not uh, there is flow and obstruction there as well. I would caution you if, um, if you have difficulty in filling the colon, uh, we, we usually use in the small babies a Foley catheter and they have, it has a, a balloon on it. So I would caution you not to inflate the balloon to generate increased pressure as that can actually lead to too much pressure and in a fragile child uh, can perforate the bowel and they may end up with the surgery that they didn't otherwise need. So just be patient. And uh, also with the contrast studies, it's important for the small babies to make sure that you use warmed contrast because um, if you use a room temperature or otherwise, it can actually lower their internal body temperature too much and uh, cause them to be an extremist.
So ilia or Trisia here, this patient has had a contrast enema, and you can see that the rectum is of relatively normal caliber, that you've identified the appendix, the vermiform appendix in the right lower quadrant, and actually been able to reflex some contrast into the terminal ileum. And that's a blind ending segment, but the proximal bowel, as you can see, is air filled and significantly distended. This is a colon that is unused and in the setting of ileal atresia. This is a study of a patient with colonic atresia, and you wouldn't necessarily know that by looking at the imaging alone. Um, it's hard to know sometimes whether bowel um, is small or large in origin. Once it gets significantly distended, it starts to lose its characteristics. So you won't see the valvula conventes and you won't see the hostile markings anymore. So it can be quite difficult to, to realize and clinical history will guide you. So in this case, um, you can see that the microcolon is up to the uh, left colon, the region of the hepatic flexure, and that it reaches the area of distended air-filled loop. And in this case, the contrast outlining the blind ending, ending segment distal to the atresia with the microcolon from there and the proximal loops. And this was uh, receptive. Colonic web can be also somewhat difficult because it can have a delayed presentation. Webs aren't always completely obstructing. The child may have some issues with passing meconium or infrequent stooling and abdominal distension. So you can see here, this child has markedly distended bowel loops, they're air-filled and they're relatively featureless, converting to air fluid levels on the upright radiograph on the left-hand side. A contrast enema was done again here. You can see filling of the enema and then outlining of this um, web. With the pressure retrograde, you can see that the web actually um, is directed upward, but then once you have more contrast past there, the natural flow is to have the contrast come out. You can see that the web is now mobile, directed inferiorly. Hirschsprung's disease is something that we encounter fairly frequently at our institution. I'm beginning to think that one in three children have it, but uh, that's not the case. Um, it's a functional obstruction due to bowel aganglionosis. And I know for some of you, you're probably opening filing cabinets in your brain that haven't been opened in a long time, so dust them off and uh, we'll go through this. Frequently, it uh, involves usually just the distal colon, but it may involve the entire colon in approximately 5% of patients. Um, we're taught typically that there is a zone of transition, but that is not always the case. And unfortunately, sometimes um, when we don't see a classic appearance, we fail to raise that as a potential cause of the problem, thereby delaying um, biopsy and treatment of the child. Most of them are rectosigmoid, so the classic teaching is where we usually expect to see it, but 15% are long segment, and as I said before, 5% are total colonic. The issue with um, reduced um, excretion is that the bowel gets distended, and then it can lead to overgrowth enterocolitis and put the child into further distress. Hirschsprungs doesn't always present in infancy. Frequently, we diagnose it in older children, too, who have been labeled with chronic constipation. So what do we look for? Well, in term infants, it's usually where we see them in infancy. As I said, the transition zone may be subtle, and you can have abnormal contractions. It's associated with that Down syndrome, trisomy 21. So here's a classic appearance of Hirschsprungs disease. You can see with this contrast enema, they have abnormal serrated appearance. Um, of the uh, rectosigmoid junction, and somewhat featureless and distended colon that has lost some of its hostile markings, and that can be, as I said before, due to overgrowth enterocolitis and the abnormalities that it then causes in the mucosa. Meconium plugs, we encounter this as another colonic obstruction. It's also known as functional immaturity of the colon, um, related with cystic fibrosis, and again, you can see it with Hirschsprung's disease as well as prematurity. It's associated with small left colon syndrome and contrast enema may relieve obstruction. This is, again, if you use water-soluble contrast. And here is a picture of small left colon. You'll see that this looks remarkably similar to our colonic atresia kid. And this is part of what I'm trying to um, 
illustrate is that multiple different abnormalities may present very similarly. So if you're not able to come out with an absolute diagnosis coming out saying that it's a high obstruction or a low obstruction and the relative area of the obstruction, that's still very useful information for our surgeons. And we have good communication with our surgeons that rely on us um, for help and for direction, especially in very young children where they want to make their surgery as um, short as possible. Uh, clinically, there's failure or delayed passage of meconium. Meconium is associated um, with cystic fibrosis, initial presentation of CF, and it's due to viscous inspissated meconium pellets. Um, again, presents as a low GI obstruction. What I want to talk about next is my rotation and volvulus, and I know I've said this already, I think, three times, but they say you have to hear something six times before you really retain it, and after lunch it might even be more than that, so just bear with me here. The reason that I'm harping on this is that, as in stroke or cardiac disease, time is, is, the, is the organ, and in this case the organ is, are the intestines. So it's a serious pediatric emergency, and you can risk ischemia to the entire mid-gut, which will put that child in a horrible position for a long period of time. At our institution, we have some children with short gut syndrome. We have other children that have intestinal transplants. If you think about that as the potential alternative, then when you get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning to do this study, you're more likely to get out of bed to do it. The superior mesenteric artery supplies the mid-gut uh, from the mid-duodenum to the transverse colon, so that's pretty much most of your usable bowel. And we're going to go through a little bit of embryology um, because that's just to understand how it happens. The primitive gut herniates uh, into the coelom, and then what you find is that there's some folding and looping, and then they end up going back into the abdomen, hopefully in the right form. So just to, in diagram form here, you can see the primitive intestinal loop with the superior mesenteric artery, and it goes through a rotation in, in a counterclockwise direction, and then returns into the abdomen. And the idea is that the transverse colon needs to be in front of the duodenum. If it's behind the duodenum, that's also abnormal. And so that's what we're trying to look for on the upper GI studies. So both loops grow in length and then rotate, and then after 90 degrees outside in the herniated sac, the remainder of the rotation happens inside. And the hope then is that the loops become fixed to the mesentery. So fixation is also an important part. The, the issue is that if things aren't fixed down, then they're free to twist upon a narrow pedicle. So as you can see here, if the Comes. The duodenum is very close proximity to the cecal butt, then the only area of fixation would be this short segment along here, which would allow the rest of the colon and uh, small bowel very, very much um, ease of, of rotating on itself and twisting. With the normal fixation, you can see that the cecum is now in the right lower quadrant, and the duodenal jejunal junction is in the left upper quadrant. So your level of fixation is about three times as long, so much less chance for things to twist. So when things go wrong, it's an arrest in the process of either rotation and or fixation, and that results in malrotation. People get all hung up in like, what degree of malrotation, is it this much or that much? The fact of the matter is, if it's not normal, then it's abnormal, and that's malrotation. The difference is, is, it is there an associated volvulus or not? So malrotation can be dealt with in time, whereas the volvulus then ends up being a surgical emergency. So with malrotation and volvulus, it leads to bowel obstruction due to twisting. You can have ischemia and or infarction because of this. You can also have obstruction due to the lat spans that form, and these are frequently seen in association with malrotation. So not only does the malrotation have to be dealt with, but the lat spans have to be lysed and the colon and the small bowel separated. These are uh, different aspects of abnormal rotation as I discussed before. Non-rotation is what happens once they've surgically corrected. 
basically if two kids can't play in the playground together, you're going to separate them, and that's what they do with the small bell and large bell. And as I said before, the reverse rotation here, you have the duodenum anterior to the transverse colon, and that's abnormal, whereas the transverse colon should be anterior, otherwise the small bowel is free to move. So what do they look like? Well, rapid onset bilious vomiting in most, 90% within the first year of life, most within the first month of life. They have bloody gastric, gastric aspirates, blood and stool, abdominal pain and distension, and once ischemic changes set in, rising lactate. Unfortunately, they also present with an irritable child, and anybody that's been a parent knows that that can happen at any given time of day, and not every irritable child has malnutrition or bolus. X-ray is pretty much useless unless you're looking for um, any other cause of obstruction, maybe to help you guide, or look for other things like free air or pneumatosis. But if you're really suspecting that there's malrotation in this, you need to do something else. Again, here, this x-ray, it looks remarkably like our pyloric atresia, and the one on the left looks remarkably like a genital atresia. But this is actually a child with malrotation in volvulus. So what do we look? On the upper GI, complete obstruction at the second or third portions of the duodenum. Proximal bowel is usually distended. Um, we have a corkscrew appearance of the duodenum and jejunum, and malrotated bowel. Again, it's really important that you pay attention to, to technique because the patient has to be straight in position to be able to decide whether it's normal or abnormal. In this case, you can see that in the supine view, there's a lot of reflux back into the esophagus. We have this blind ending, somewhat beaked appearance of the junction of the second portion of the duodenum, and it's not moving at all. It's a complete obstruction. That doesn't happen in all. Sometimes there is some flow through, but that's why they present with the bilious vomiting. If you're lucky enough to have the contrast pass through, as in this case, you can see that there is that swirling inferior rotation of the bowel, and that there is no point where the duodenal jejunal junction is in the appropriate position. In this case, it was followed through, and you can see, similar to the diagram I showed you earlier, that with the cecum high in the right upper quadrant and the duodenum and proximal jejunum coursing inferiorly, that your mesenteric band of fixation is very narrow, allowing um, the rotation to happen. Pitfalls. So too much contrast too fast and not being able to see the first pass ends up being problematic. Poor emptying of contrast ends up being a difficulty as well because if you have no contrast going distally, you don't know whether or not you have a duodenal web, duodenal stenosis, um, or potentially malrotation. What you have identified, however, is that there's an upper obstruction that requires surgical intervention. And so that's enough to, to have that information. Cross-sectional imaging um, utility in malrotation and bogless is not, um, ultrasound is used, but certainly other things like MRI or CT are not used for that purpose. Again, further imaging, if you've already identified that a child needs surgery, only delays time and actually doesn't help anything. Um, ultrasound, we find, has a complementary role. Sometimes um, it's incidentally found, and it's sick kids as part of our ultrasound abdomen protocol. We look for the relationship of the superior mesoteric artery and vein in all of our patients, at least we try. Um, CT has, as I said, limited role, but sometimes we see things fortuitously in an older child that's managed to escape detection. What do we look for? Again, it's similar to the x-ray and upper GI. Our proportions that are proximal to the obstruction are distended. You can see free peritoneal fluid if the obstruction's gone on long enough. And again, look for inversion or malposition of the superior mesenteric artery and vein. So either it's ventral to one another in the relationship, or that it's left of the artery on the ultrasound. The other thing that we also look for is oral pooling of the gut, so swirling around the mesenteric root, and you see initially distension of the blood vessels and then no flow distally if it's been complete. So again, normal superior mesenteric artery and vein relationship of the level of the pancreas and abnormal with reversal on the opposite side. Here we have um, features that make you think 
that maybe there's something more going on. It looks very busy around the superior mesenteric artery and vein. There are more vessels there than you ought to see. And they're dilated and congested veins proximal to the twist, which when you apply color Doppler and scan slightly inferiorly, so at the level of the immediate twist, you may not see the distended veins, but as you scan and just direct your transducer slightly inferiorly, you'll see this distended um, venous congestion and the swirling around the mesenteric root. Well, what's associated with malrotation above this? Lots of things. Omphalocele, gastroschisis, hernias, heterotaxy. And in phalocele, gastroschisis, and diaphragmatic hernia, again, it makes total sense because the bowel has not had the chance to be fixed appropriately. So again, the mesenteric fixation is missing and it's free to move. Um, again, other things, duodenal atresia, duodenal web. So don't stop looking for things once you've found one. So let's talk about other acquired things. So hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Um, I think everybody's probably seen at least one in their imaging time. non bilious vomiting, males more than females, usually between two and six weeks of life, but they can be older. And this is a dynamic study as well. So even though you may look for a length greater than 16 millimeters and a single muscle width of 3.5 millimeters or greater, you also look to see that the pylorus actually opens. The reason for that is if child are receiving prostaglandins or other things, the mucosa can be hypertrophied. You may end up with a falsely thickened appearance, but if the pylorus opens normally, then it's not by different, it's not stenosed. Here you can see a study that was done as an upper GI. Usually uh, upper GI is not our go-to to, uh, make this diagnosis. This was a child that came to us later, and so the issue uh, didn't actually occur to anybody that it could be a late presentation of HPS. And it looks again like an apple core lesion of the uh, pyloric channel with an umbrella shape on the um, end as you enter the duodenum. This is more what we're comfortable with with the ultrasound appearance non-opening pillar channel again with the dimensions as we discussed. Lower obstruction. So let's move on into the lower part. Clinically, how do they present? Uh, red jelly stools, lots when you look on an ultrasound, uh, concentric rings about wall, and 90% of the intussusceptions that we see are of the iliocolic variety, but ilio-ilio and ilio-iliocolic and colocolic can also occur. Certainly, any point of bowel that's not fixed down is free to intussuscept. Diagnosing an intussusception alone, well, that's something that we definitely need to do. We also need to look for a lead point because if you reduce that intussusception and the child has a lead point, it's only quite likely that it will recur. What do you want to do? So, we have lots of referrals that come to our hospitals that say that they're intussusceptions and they're not intussusceptions. So it's important to identify, is it truly an intussusception? Where does it live and what is it made of? Is there a high degree of obstruction? How stable is the patient? Are they amenable to radiologic reduction or do they need to go to surgery white way? All of these things that need to pass your mind. So what are we looking for and what are the contraindications? Well, certainly peritonitis is a contraindication to reduction attempt. Um, and longer duration of the bowel may be, or the intussusception may make your attempt at reduction more difficult due to edema and inflammatory changes in the bowel segments. Here we have a classic appearance of an intussusception, of invagination of a segment of bowel into another bowel segment, drags along its mesentery and with it the mesenteric root and vessels, and frequently it will have lymph nodes within it as well. By doing this, it obstructs the lumen and compresses the vascular supply. In this case, um, in all interceptions, we search for the vascularity of the internal component as well as the vascularity of the external component, and that's so that we ensure that if we do a reduction attempt, that we're not uh, forcing ischemic bowel into the, the peritoneum and with the risk of rupture. Uh, air enema reduction is the method that we use at our institution. Other institutions use ultrasound and, and water. Um, other places still use um, barium or other contrast on their fluoroscopy. Um, our engineering department has created a contraption for us that we can monitor the millimeters of mercury of pressure and we use air under fluoroscopy. 
As this is a procedure with risks, we obtain informed consent from the parents, and we notify general surgery as well, so that should something go wrong, or if it doesn't go well at all, and they need surgery, that they're aware and there's no surprises. Um, again, just using a catheter in the rectum, this is one where we do use um, the Foley balloon uh, inflated, and we monitor the pressure. The other thing is uh, for safety to have an angiocatheter present in the case of uh, pneumoperitoneum. Pneumoperitoneum in and of itself is not an indication to use the angiocatheter, but it's uh, just for tension pneumoperitoneum. And the other thing in preparation for any of our children with uh, intussusception for reduction is that they must have an IV that's functional should they need to go to the OR stop. We start with 80 millimeters of mercury, increase to 100, and maintain pressure for one to three minutes, up to three attempts. Now, I would have to say that the degree of pressure that I use and the harder I try will be based on how confident I am in the ultrasound findings. If I'm worried that the bowel is really, really sick, I might not use as high a pressure or for as long. And on fluoroscopy, you can follow the reducing mass to the ileocecal junction. We, if we're not successful, we do a redo as long as the patient is stable and does not have any further contraindications in the interval. Um, we found good success with second attempts, even though sometimes the first event isn't. So here you can see this patient is supine. Um, the yellow arrow uh, is outlining the intussusception mass, and you can see that initially it's in the transverse colon near the splenic flexure and with further distension, you can see that the bowel is becoming further distended with air. It's being reduced and then in the uh, hepatic flexure and then towards the ileocecal valve. And at the uh, last image there without the arrow, you still have an edematous ileocecal valve that appears as a filling defect, but you have free uh, reflexive air into the small bowel. So it's important to recognize that an edematous ileocecal valve can still masquerade as a filling defect, but is not necessarily a residual um, intussusception. What do we look for? So we're looking for a donut-shaped circumferential um, mass, pseudomass lesion. In this case, it was a patient that had a structure in the left upper quadrant. And I'm showing you this case because this is one we didn't get right. Um, and I'll tell you why. So the size of this lesion looks like it should be colonic, 4.7 by 5.6, and on the longitudinal view, it looks long, it looks like an intussusception, looks for all the world like an intussusception. The issue is we took the child after consent and did an enema reduction, and right before the enema, there was an intussusception, brought the patient in, and Nobody saw the intussusception. We just saw free reflex into the small bowel. Okay, well, it's a miracle. Um, we're so good. Um, but we did that actually another time where we did the ultrasound again, and it was still there. What we failed to do, though, was ensure that the intussusception by ultrasound was followed all the way back along the colon, back to the right lower quadrant. And in this case, it was actually a duodenal web causing a duodenal to genal intussusception. So just be aware that any large intussusception that you see may not be of an ileocolic variety. So follow it back to the right lower quadrant. So that's the pearl from that. Bowel polyps can also cause colocolic intussusception. And again, to see an intussusception that extends all the way to the rectal region in behind the bladder is quite abnormal. And in this case, um, reduction was not attempted as it was recognized that this was quite abnormal and on the um, CT scan here, the coronal reconstruction, there's a polyp that is leading um, the lead point. Again, every time you have an intussusception, make sure you look for a lead point because that can cause recurrence if it's not identified and may lead to prolonging, uh, prolonged attempts and multiple attempts at reduction. Mind you, just having a lead point alone does not preclude you from trying to do an intussusception reduction. If um, the obstruction is relieved, then surgery can be planned in a much more organized manner rather than an urgent manner when the obstruction is still there. So, summary of obstruction. What do we hope to gain from all of this? Try and establish whether it's a high or low obstruction. Exclude malrotation and follicle in an emergent fashion.
Use your clinical parameters and imaging to guide further investigation as multiple things can look the same in children. Recognize that there's a spectrum of disorders in neonates and beyond that can lead to intestinal obstruction. And I urge you to use meticulous ultrasound technique to determine the nature of the intussusception. Thank you.